everyone. I'm Gretchen Wilkins. I'm the architect in residence and head of architecture here at Cranbrook. And we're very, very pleased to have Frank Fantauzzi here with us tonight. Frank uh, is an alum of the program and shares a lot of uh, particularly interest in alternative architectural practices. And that's something um, we've been talking a lot about this semester in, in our department. So it's lovely to have you here. Frank received his undergraduate degree from Carleton University in Canada and his graduate degree obviously from here. He's taught numerous programs in Canada, the US, and Finland, with research focuses on the question of alternative forms of critical architectural practice. And parallel to teaching, Frank has also been engaged in, in an active art practice which began in 1989. His work is often collaborative and focuses on large scale installations, I'm sure we'll see some of that tonight, and perhaps some of the work from Cranbrook, um, and outdoor constructions. It has been exhibited and published internationally and is interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary in nature, probing the built environment to explore the cultural dimensions of society and the parallels between social and tectonic structures. He is also a founding member of the Iceberg Project Collaborative Practice. Please join me in welcoming Frank Fantauzzi. Uh, thank you, Gretchen. Um, it's great to be here, guys. I've, um, I've uh, had a long uh, relationship with Cranbrook, as uh, Gretchen mentioned, I studied here. And um, uh, after graduating, and I went out to teach, uh, I've had students of mine have come here. In fact, uh, Charlie O'Gene is sitting up there. And uh, Charlie, as I said, was a student of mine at, at University of Buffalo and went on to uh, study here himself. And uh, he and I, have uh, both when he was a student, but, but certainly in past years, have started doing projects together. So. This work that I'm showing you is, has been um, important, not just in terms of its content, but also in terms of the kind of a group of people that it's tied together and, and, and the, the kind of energies that those people uh, shared. So I, I want to be clear about that from the very beginning. A lot of this work is collaborative. Um, I also, uh, you'll see also that what I want to talk about t today are some of the uh, cross-fertilization opportunities and uh, uh, moments in, 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 um, in my career between teaching and, and my own practices. Um, I've always, known that, that the two would impact each other. Um, I'm, I generally are not overly conscious of it, but I know the two are beginning to impact each other. And that for me is, is, a, is important because it seems to me that the research I do should be feeding back into my teaching. And I, I think what you'll see here is that the work itself is actually didactic. It's educational in nature. Um, I really believe in things speaking for themselves. Um, and these projects, I think you'll, you, you'll agree that they're really intended for, to, um, introduce a layperson to a set of uh, uh, issues that they may not be aware of, that may be invisible to them. Um, so that's, again, a couple of different ways to, uh, to characterize the work. Um, I titled the, the, uh, the lecture still at Cranbrook uh, because in some ways I think Cranbrook uh, follows me. Uh, so in terms of spirit, in terms of the reason I do my work, uh, I'm very much uh, still here at Cranbrook. And you'll, know, you'll notice in a couple of projects that we actually did a project here uh, actually called Still, and you'll actually get a chance to see it in, in a moment. Oops. Yeah. Um, as I said earlier, uh, there are these threads in the work, and uh, I'm fascinated every time I come across one. So what you're seeing uh, now, for example, uh, to, to your right, uh, is actually a, a couple of uh, drawings from my uh, undergraduate thesis project, way back when I was at Carleton University in uh, Ottawa, Canada. Then to the top, um, left is the very first project I did with uh, graduates from, from uh, uh, Cranbrook, especially uh, there are three or four people in particular that I have done numerous projects with. And then finally, the project to the uh, left bottom is actually uh, one of uh, the more ambitious studio projects that I was able to, to run when I was at the University of Buffalo and a project that still exists. And, and that was very exciting, obviously, to do a project that would be permanent and, and would be as close to making, you know, uh, architectures you could possibly get, get students, uh, you know, uh, 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 to, to achieve. Um, so as you can see, there are these kinds of connections, even the fact that these are single family houses, which somehow ha has been fascinating to me for a long time. I think it has a lot to do with the notion that the house is a kind of, it's a kind of body, you know, kind of, uh, 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 it's, a, it's sort of a kind of a mirror of, of oneself, let's say. Even the way that they appear, et cetera, is very much like uh, like a person. So I think maybe that's one of the re the reasons why I keep gravitating to houses as as, um, as opportunities. Um, so what I'm going to show you uh, are a number of projects. I'll, I'll, I'll um, not say much about 
the individual projects because really what I'm hoping for is, is for all of you to begin to see these patterns that I'm talking about. The projects are not chronological on purpose uh, so that I could link one thing from a teaching situation and something that I might have done uh, in a col collaborative situation. Uh, and I hope those, those, uh, you know, those connections are, are, uh, are evident. Uh, and again, I, I don't want to overplay them because they were never um, uh, uh, you know, totally intentional. Um, so let's begin with this project here. This is um, um, the very first project as I mentioned that I did with um, uh, a group of uh, graduates. Uh, I graduated actually slightly ahead of uh, multiple people that worked in this project. So Jean-Claude Azar, uh, who, came, who be, uh, went on to be Cranbrook's uh, architect, uh, James Cathcart, Michael Williams, uh, uh, and uh, Terence Benalslander have become real mainstays, uh, in particular James Cathcart, and then I would say uh, uh, Terence as well. Um, and this project was, uh, we were invited to do a project, an installation at the Willis Gallery, which was quite an interesting place, had strong connections to uh, Cranbrook at the time. And uh, as I said, I had just graduated. The other colleagues were actually in their final year uh, uh, you know, doing their thesis. And we decided to do a project that totally avoided representation. Um, for, for, for me, that's always been a dilemma in architecture. We spend all our time teaching students how to make drawings and models. And drawings and models are not buildings. And that translation is a very, very tricky one. So uh, you know, any opportunity to do things empirically, to, to build a, what we would call a phenomenological relationship with the work, uh, we, we always took. So this project for me, I think, uh, was central because um, it, it had another agenda, as, as uh, Gretchen was, was saying, I, th I think a lot of the work that we have done ends up being indexes of cultural dynamics. Uh, you know, architecture buildings are, are, are similar to other products, and you can tell a lot about a society by the products that it, that it values, the things that it develops. Um, so again, for us, it's, there's, there's so much that these um, objects in the city can, can, uh, can teach us. So the project was very, very straightforward. We bought a house from Detroit for a dollar. It's on the left. It, it's, it was at 9119 Saints Rural downtown. And we, uh, over the space of a week, took the house apart with just hand tools. There was no electricity on site. And created a kind of taxonomy in the gallery. So we began at the very back corner of the gallery and placed all the uh, materials from that day's work. And we would do this every single day. And I think it took, a, it, was, it took a little over a week, I believe, to, to, to complete the project. Five of us, one week. It actually was also a kind of measurement project in terms of labor, in terms of what can, one could achieve. Finally, it was also a very strange project because we were undoing a building just as we were graduating from uh, uh, architecture school, which is odd, right? It's like it's, it's like it's the opposite. But strangely enough, it was an education. It was an incredible education. Actually, one that I would love architecture students in general to have access to because until you start pulling a nail out of something, you don't really understand you know, how these materials work and the structure and uh, you know, why things are built the way they are. Also, built, taking something apart is really interesting because it, it turns out that there's a very specific logic to it. It's pretty much in reverse. The windows come out, the doors come out, et cetera. And that was fascinating to see the building actually go from one state to another to another. So at one point, the building was all lath. At another point, the building was all insulation. Depending on the, on the layer that we were peeling away, the building literally transformed from day to day. All of these things were really um, you know, uh, uh, surprises to us when we were um, engaged in the project. Um, and, and, and lastly, let me just say, because this will be the last time you'll see the image on the right, that again, this is what I was talking about in terms of how to engage a, a, a lay audience. When, when you walk into that space, first of all, there's the smell of the material. There's all the colors, all of the pigments, everything you could imagine that the, that the material is, is collected over time. And to be, see it all in one shot is, is, was really quite dramatic. And I also like to talk about this in terms of the, the American uh, dream, right? The single family house is supposed to be the American dream. And we realized, first of all, how easy it is. You can actually see it in one place, just how, uh, how can I say it, how limited and finite it actually is. And then also how easily it can be evaporated or disappeared. We were talking earlier today about the forces in Detroit. I mean, Detroit is one of the cities uh, in the United States that is least um, resistant to capital. It's designed to just do everything the capital wants it to do. Um, it's a machine, a huge machine. And so the question is, what does it mean to live in cities like that? And I think this project was trying to get at some of those questions. We're sure the person who lived there lost her job when, one of the, when, when there was some sort of economic downturn. Uh, and then sure enough, in the, in the house, we'd find letters from prison, from other, you know, other uh, situations that made it clear what was happening to that family as, um, as uh, things were happening uh, in Detroit. 
So uh, there, there are many photographs that you know uh, are just very uh, interesting because they're, um, well, they're, they're, they're architecture in these kind of in-between uh, states, let's say. Um, you know, interesting moments like the one on the uh, left where the peak of the house rotated backwards. As it was the easiest way for us to take it down and it creates this kind of form that you know, though surprising we're being able to actually see the plan of the building. Um, and then lastly, when the project was done, we went back to the place exactly one year later and we took a photograph of the same site. And it's amazing how fast nature fills in. Um, and you, all of you that are from Detroit or, or, or you know, have uh, been downtown will know that that's what's happening is that there are entire areas that are being reclaimed. It's almost like uh, farmland downtown in some cases. Um, so this interest in Detroit, I think, was really important to us and uh, we wanted to find ways to, to, to uh, explore it further. Uh, James, Terrence, and I were invited to do a, uh, to be guest editors of uh, editing, I'm sorry, of uh, New Observations, which is a magazine out of uh, New York. And the magazine is dedicated, they have a different editor every time, and it's dedicated to one theme. So we decided to, uh, to uh, edit a, uh, a, um, a uh, you know, a, 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 an issue of uh, New Observations that remapped Detroit. We invited 11 people, artists, um, writers, architects, uh, various individuals that, that we knew had an interest in, in the city. And uh, the project developed as, uh, as, as, as follows. Before I, I do that, I just want to show you a couple of images. One of the things that we did um, it, during the time that we were doing these, uh, collab uh, these collaborative installations is we also started digging back in time to see what, um, what else we could find out about Detroit. And I found the things that I had no, no idea about. So for example, on the left is the, uh, is the uh, actually I guess that's one image, I'm looking at two of them. Um, the, this image is, a, is, a, is the third occupation of Detroit by uh, the US military. And I believe it's, it's still the only city that's been occupied three separate times. Um, and then this image was shocking to me. Uh, we saw the, the photograph that you're seeing and we found, we located this area. This is a wall, it's a concrete wall that's one mile long. Um, and it was actually built to prevent uh, integration. Uh, it's actually still, uh, it's at eight mile, you can actually find it. And if you look at the top right, I'm sorry, top left, uh, is the wall today, it's covered in graffiti, uh, but it's still there. Um, and I, you know, it occurred to me that that was like our Berlin Wall in Detroit, right? And then of course this image, or images like it, I think many of you know, that, uh, I've seen this in other, in other uh, contexts, but here's a theater in downtown Detroit that was turned into a parking garage. And this is what I meant about the, the, the power of capital and how it can change every other desire that we, that we may have as a, you know, as a, as a, as a society. <clears throat> um, James, Terrence, and I would get together three, four times a year and we'd do a project. We'd go someplace, we'd be invited to, to a gallery or to a school, we would cut, you know, carve away a certain amount of time and we'd go there without preconception and we'd come up with a project that we felt was, was truly site specific. Um, in between, we would do our own projects, and uh, James would often refer to these as um, homework projects. So one of the things that, um, uh, one of the pieces of homework projects that uh, James was doing in those days, he was, he was drilling things. Anything he could get his hands on, he, he, he drilled holes in it, uh, including this subway map of, in this case, uh, I think it's uh, New York. Um, but that then, th those homework projects then sometimes become full life projects that all three of us are involved in that take more effort. So this, that idea spawned this idea, which was we took a map of Detroit in this case, a folded map, a standard folded map, and we drilled four holes in it. It actually looked a little bit like a brick once we drilled the holes in it. When you uh, open up the map, um, you um, realize that there are all these missing areas. And the challenge to the 11 uh, contributors w w was to, in their own way, reestablish those missing areas. And people did all kinds of different things to do that, but I'll show you just one or two very simple examples. This, this is one that I think is absolutely clear. And again, this is what I mean about um, communicating in a very direct way. What we see here are six circles going from downtown um, uh, Detroit all the way to the suburbs. And what you'll see, for example, at the top uh, left is, is a typical African-American neighborhood downtown. And all of those black areas are buildings that were uh, torn down or burnt down and were never rebuilt. So what you can see there is that more than half of the building stock is gone. And then if you look to the far right, uh, we're talking about you know, areas closer to here, Ferndale, um, um, I forget how the names were, all those places uh, would look something like the, uh, the map on the top right where perhaps because of fires, three or four buildings are missing. 
Um, just to take a little time out, in my teaching, especially after studying at Cranbrook, um, I wanted so much to have my students learn from the world. I, I remember writing something about, the, the title of which was um, Conspiring with the World. That as an architecture professor, if I could find ways to put my students today in a, um, in a real situation, in an authentic situation, they would understand and be able to do architecture more, more immediately, let's say. So I've always found ways to do that. Uh, obviously, working in real buildings, you know, building one-to-one, -one, uh, those kinds of things, but, but other ways too. For example, on, 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 um, uh, on this, in this image here, when I was teaching a first-year studio, I realized I need to teach students the difference between plan and section. So I asked each one of them to come in with a pair of shoes, an old pair of shoes that they had. And in one case, I asked them to cut the shoe every inch, or, sorry, an inch or inch and a half, and then they use it as a stamp to actually make the sections. And you can see that on the right-hand side. And then on the left, what you're seeing is a second shoe, which is actually flattened topologically, because we all know that, you know, in the case of something like leather shoes, for example, that it, their, their flat patterns are then curved and, and actually stitched together. So that would be essentially like an elevation in, in an architectural situation. So these are the ways that I found to, to as I say, kind of keep us, you know, keep the, eye, uh, the student's eyes on the prize. This is similar. Um, I, I love uh, projects that have process built in. So in this case, I asked students to collect uh, a number of objects from home. You can see that, uh, uh, in this case, in, again, the top left. And then to uh, somehow erase them, either through wrapping them or painting them. So that happens then on the bottom. And then lastly, after it's all been wrapped, I asked them to take uh, sections through it, which of course they can't get to anymore. <laughs> so they have to reimagine what's actually on the inside. So you can see on the, on the right part of this image, both sketches at the bottom as well as um, you know, drafted sections at the top. And uh, I'm gonna show this project. This, this happened uh, qu quite a number of years after the, much of the work that I'm showing you, but I wanna show it to you now because again, I think it's, it's a nice sort of uh, bracket to go along with the St. Cyril project. This is in Buffalo, um, uh, you can see 2007. And this was a, a very uh, unique opportunity. It's rare that something like this would happen. But uh, I had a, a community member, a young woman approach me about this house that she inherited from her family that was in uh, dire shape and that the courts had ruled had to be uh, demolished. And she was really unhappy about it. She grew up in this house and she didn't want to see it disappear. Um, so she came to me and asked if we would do a studio to rehabilitate the building. And I, I, I agreed, uh, she went back to the course, she got permission, she uh, was given time. And through, in that way, we got to do this project basically. And clearly there were problems, you know, some of the chimneys had to be taken down, et cetera. Some of there were structural problems, but um, uh, apart from that, which were actually, to be honest, fairly easy fixes, I, I also um, wanted to make sure the studio could do something with this building that was interesting to them. They could, be, they could play with it, they could experiment with it. And, we had a client who was totally ready to do it. She was, she understood we're gonna do something, you know, uh, provocative, and she totally backed us. Um, and so the project, as I said, has a couple of dimensions, one of which is just simply rehabilitating. And again, this is a great experience for, for young architecture students because they really understand then how things go together. And you can see we started cutting through the building, we started opening it up, and it became a much, much more um, 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 a pleasant space to be in. Uh, and we did actually get to the point, we did not put in services, uh, but we, we did get to the point where it was all framed uh, and, and much of it was actually drywall by the time we were done. As I said, the, um, the um, owner gave us a lot of license and the students and I started to make models, we started drawing, and somewhere along the line we came up with this idea of rotating the front of the house. Um, and I was excited about that because I knew to do it, you'd have to really understand how the building goes together, what, is it, what makes it stable. But I knew it was doable and I knew we could do it empirically. We didn't need engineers, we didn't need to run through, necessarily through the building department. So I arranged something where the city allowed us to do this and then pr uh, provide drawings after the fact. And the proviso was that we had an engineer involved who would visit the site on a regular basis. So every time we made a decision about a, a sizing steel or how much we could cut away, there was someone that could back uh, our intuition, basically. Um, and like I said, that's really rare. And, I, and that goes back to, the, again, to my whole discussion about representation, is that while you're working in this realm of abstractness, that gets built. It gets built just the way, the way they, you know, they see it on the drawing. Um, so again, it was an amazing thing. Um, and, and even just the, the act of, of um, flipping the house, of turning it, turned out to be an incredibly 
um, you know, unexpected things. So for example, if you look carefully, especially in the middle image, you'll notice there was another house right next to it, and it was actually uh, protruding uh, in, you know, in front of, uh, of the building we were working with. So it became clear to me that we couldn't spin the house or the facade with a center point, that the facade actually had to physically move out of the way before it could actually start turning. So what you'll see here is in the very first image on the left is that we built a track along the bottom. We cut the facade away and restructured it because uh, as many of you know, the only thing that keeps a house of that form from, from going side to side is the front and back. They act as, as um, membranes to keep it from, from racking. So we had to rebuild, we had to put steel back in. You can see actually, So as I said, the first step was to move it over. The second step was to lift it up on a mast that's behind it. And then the third step is to spin it. So, um, so here you see the house beginning to spin on the right-hand side. And on the left, you actually see the mechanism that's, that's actually driving it, which turns out to be a large turntable made of, uh, I think it was two by eights, that were uh, laminated on top of one another to approximate a circle. Um, it was an amazing thing. <laughs> and just the, the, no, no, just the, the act of actually seeing it begin to move was, was, it was just, um, it's hard to explain, but it, it was a kind of unhinging of the most stable thing you could imagine, which is a single family house facade. Here's some other photographs. The neighbors could not believe what they were seeing. <laughs> uh, in fact, this is another interesting thing is that this was a very small street, didn't go, really go from any place important to any other place important. But once this project uh, started and people started finding out, the street was just filled with cars. They would come along, they would stop, take photographs, kept, keep, kept going, and the neighbors loved it. The neighbors finally felt that their neighborhood was actually being paid attention to. Um, and I can offer you this to give you a sense of uh, how it works. We went around twice just to prove that we could. <laughs> this is all in one day, as you can see. It's starting to get dark now. <laughs> and this is a final position. So the, the idea is that, um, you can see it here on the right, that the, um, that the new building uh, would change where the open areas would be glazed. You can see the attic is now fully open. In fact, it was actually a fantastic ledge to, to uh, uh, to stand at. Uh, the windows are still windows, the door became a window, uh, and the new entry is that gap now on the right-hand side, so that actually uh, uh, got a new door. Okay, um, so as, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing things, and I'm trying to sort of, uh, again, make some connections. This is a, a project that, um, that was done here at Cranbrook. So as, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, there's several projects that, that have been done here. This was uh, when Dan Hoffman became the um, the head of architecture, he invited James, Terrence, and I, after some of the other projects that you've seen, he invited us to use the space in the new uh, studio spaces where uh, the, the studio currently uh, resides. And believe it or not, this is actually um, Gretchen's office. <laughs> so Gretchen's office used to have a ceiling. Um, <laughs> and, actually, and I'm not sure who put that ceiling there, but it actually may have been an original ceiling. Um, one of the things that we started getting really excited about is the idea of making work without bringing a lot of material in like actually working from the space itself, from the very little clues that you can, you know, that you could, um, uh, that you can sort of sink your teeth into. And what we discovered in this particular case was that there was an, uh, uh, an amazing space above this area, which was actually being used for reviews at the time. Um, and we poked around and we decided, one of the things we discovered, you, you need to know this, is that the particular structural system that they used was a series of metal purlins with uh, mesh. And then they, uh, 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 I guess, uh, uh, apply plaster to it. So we knew that this entire plane actually had steel running through it everywhere. So that told us that we could hinge it. And so what we did was we cut a rectangle out of the ceiling such that the short dimension was exactly the same as the floor to the ceiling. So when the ceiling would rotate down, it would become a wall and would actually support itself. That was the entire thing. Um, I've never told people this in a lecture, but I'll tell you guys because this is Cranbrook. These images you're seeing are not the actual project being done. These are the images of the project being put back up. 
because we were, in, in those days, we were not thinking about you know, showing work in lectures. We just wanted to do the project. Um, and we have no documentation of that thing being lowered, except for one or two photographs. You'll see one in a second. Um, so literally, after we did our project, Francis Rizendis, who's uh, one of the students, um, very carefully put all that, that uh, structure there so the, the ceiling wouldn't crack, and then put it back up. But when we lowered it down, there was none of that. It was nothing but rope and, um, and the ceiling. In fact, I still remember, uh, I think Dan Hoffman gave, gave us $100 for materials. And we spent, I don't know, like $60 on rope and like $40 on a bottle of scotch, basically. <laughs> and it was like the best combination. Um, anyway, so this is uh, the, pro the, the, again, it, it's in reverse. And actually, the photograph on the right is actually of the project being done. And James is the fellow in the middle, Janine Centuri is the, the, the young lady next to her, and Francis is the guy that looks like, uh, like uh, Hercules. Um, and actually, uh, and Robert Christ to the far left was a painting student here. So again, it's, you know, it was all family. It was always a way to get people together to do things that, um, uh, you know, that, that we wanted to experiment with. This was a finished product. So what happened is when you first approached the space, which is on the right, you actually saw the ceiling, and it even has, you know, the circles where the outlets were, et cetera. And then on the, uh, on the left, is actually the surface that's never been seen, which was that impregnated um, mesh, and you could see the purlins in it. And it literally touched the floor, so we didn't have to worry about it, uh, you know, weakening. Um, and again, it went, you know, so, so this, I mean, there's a lot of things we could talk about here. We could talk about language, going from ceiling to wall. There's a lot of different things that are, you know, semiotic things that are going on, but also just the simple idea of um, direct action, you know, working by, by, by engaging. Um, <coughs> I'm going to show you two or three more projects that I did with James and Terrence because I, I, I think that for me that work is still uh, the most um, complete in terms of the things that we, we uh, experiment with. And also one of the things that we tried very hard in our work was not to repeat ourselves. I, I remember re reading, you know, when I first discovered uh, Marcel Duchamp, you know, that was one of, the, one of the things about his work that always blew me away was he was able to like constantly reinvent himself and, and so it's important. Uh, it was very important for us, as I said, not to, uh, not to be a one-trick pony, as it were. This project was in uh, uh, Grand Rapids, um, and uh, uh, it was actually Michael Grad that was running uh, this gallery, and we were invited to do, to do one of these one-week projects. The building itself was absolutely, it was, uh, excuse me, exactly next door to this huge electrical substation, and um, we thought, well, that's interesting. Is there a way that we can use electricity and this substation to inform our project? And we ended up, um, you can see by the way on the right hand side, the uh, uh, fuse panel or the uh, breaker panel for the entire building. So there was this kind of, we're very interested in this notion of all of this electricity available to this little building, the mechanisms for turning it on and off. Um, and the project developed in the following way then. You can see here, this is a very blurry image. Um, the larger space, the kind of square space that has letters on it, that was the gallery space we were to work with. And the one thing we noticed in the gallery space that was really unique was that it had this very dense uh, ceiling grid of outlets for whatever reason we don't know. But just like every, so, you know, frequently there were, these, there were these outlets. And we started wondering if we could do something with that. Uh, as we discussed this, we did some research and we found a place that sold uh, Nikron wire. And Nikron wire is the exact same wire that's used in toasters. So that wire is designed to heat up. It gives, it, it's very resistant, doesn't want the current to go through and therefore it heats up and turns red. Uh, a lot like a filament in, in a light bulb, for example, at least old-fashioned light bulbs. Um, so, so, the, so we discovered this, and, and we talked to an electrician. And he explained the more of this wire you use, the more resistance you're putting putting up, and, and you start, you know, tripping breakers. Which, by the way, is very strange. It's this whole thing I've been wondering about, having to do with resistance and and using things. So it's, you're using all this electricity by resisting it. It's a very interesting concept. Every one of us is, is has access to unlimited electricity. So it's what we put up to resist it, our radio, our computer, you know, the toaster. Um, so anyway, the project became um, quite simple once we thought, through, thought it through. And that is that we began to hang these Nikron wires. We did some wiring, uh, put, you know, uh, plugs on the ends. And uh, we're able to plug these Nikron wires directly into the ceiling grid. Um, and when you plug them in, they would turn red hot. Obviously, there's a Second, the, the circuit has to have a second piece of wire, which is actually insulated, that goes back up to the, to the plug. Um, and we began to make these lines of, of, um, of uh, pure electricity, of, of, uh, you know, of uh, pure resistance. Uh, we kept doing this until 
we tapped out all the power to the building. I knew enough about electricity that I was able to reroute all of the things in the fuse box. So slowly, the entire building got shut down. The entire building was essentially unusable, except for the gallery, which was essentially its largest toaster at this point. Um, and what it was, what the project became about, uh, was really visualizing electricity, visualizing the capacity in, in a building that we never think about. Uh, so again, it became a kind of didactic uh, project for, um, um, you know, for, for a layperson, let's say. Um, I'm going to go back real quick. The one detail here, which turned out to be the most um, controversial detail, but I still like it. Um, one of the problems with the micron wire is that it shrinks and expands. So we had to find a way to make them tight. So we figured out that by putting a baggie of water at the very bottom with a loop, that the baggie would move a, a, as, the, as the micron wire heated up and then cooled down. And that kept all the wires, it kept them both straight, but it also kept them in position because you, you don't want them float, uh, moving around because if they touch it, they'll burn you instantly. Um, but it also created another problem, which is that now you have all these bags filled with water, which if they all busted, the entire floor would be le electrified, basically. So it became this very strange project about just you know the, the kind of um, the kind of harshness of of, of, of the space. Uh, it's hard to explain. It was incredibly hot. You could you could only uh, stand and talk to somebody next to it for a certain amount of time. All these measurements, all of these gauge, all these in index indexes that we were coming across, as I said, were were uh, readily you know um, evident at the very beginning. Um, along with a little more, um, along with a little bit more um, um, recognition, we were, we were um, invited to the storefront for art and architecture. New York um, was a venerable institution. A lot of the uh, architects that I was interested in had done shows there, and I was following pretty closely. Kyung Park, by the way, who um, came to Detroit and actually did some work here in Detroit, was running it at the time, um, and it was just a great opportunity for us to uh, to show our work. Um, Again, we did not want to do uh, something representational, something formal. So we came up with a project that was really, really t turned out to be a kind of urban space experiment, to, to put it simply. If any of you have been there, you know that the storefront is a big triangle. So what you're seeing here is, the, is literally the, 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 um, the plan of it, and the very point there is at a corner of a block. So it's one entire, um, you know, the, the one entire facade of this is the storefront. That's why they call it that. And in fact, you see here, that they had written on it for the long longest time, uh, the word storefront, and you can see the images on the uh, left. You can sort of see where they are in terms of the, um, the, the urban context. Um, the project that came to us was, um, again, very simple, very direct, but also one that had lots and lots of resonances. One of the things with these projects that, um, that I'm starting to realize, and we sort of realized it, certainly with this project, was that by doing these kinds of projects, you start to uncover forces that you don't even know are there. You start tripping over things that that all of a sudden become really big issues. So we proposed a project which seemed straight enough, straightforward enough, but then got a huge amount of resistance because of certain readings of the project. So let me tell you what the project is, and then you, you might sort of uh, be able to empathize with the, uh, with the people that were making those decisions. The project we proposed was to rent and insert five portable toilets through the facade that would be open to the public for the six weeks of the exhibition. So the project was essentially to give over the gallery space to the homeless, to give over this, the gallery space to people that uh, cannot afford to use a bathroom in New York because there are no pu public bathrooms. Um, but really what it was was also a kind of reversal. And so you, what you see here is the, pro the project in process. It was very straightforward. The entire facade was non-load bearing. Again, we knew that as architects, we could see it. Um, so we were able to cut with sawzalls very precisely the cross section of a portable toilet, insert it, insulate it, uh, and then it was ready to use. In fact, as we were putting them in, um, people would come along. <laughs> there was one instance where this little boy and his uh, father came along, and the boy clearly had to go to the bathroom, and, and the dad was so happy that you know, the, the kid could actually use the toilet. Um, so it had this kind, it was a very, very real project in terms of the way people saw it and, and used it. Um, this is, uh, unfortunately, a repetition. My apologies. This is the finished installation from the outside, and this is the finished installation from the inside. Um, it was a really interesting project, and we discovered a couple things. I think one of the most sort of amusing things is that we forgot, we didn't take into consideration that the vents from these portable toilets were near the back. So once we installed them and people started using them, the entire gallery started to smell very bad. 
And so we ended up having to uh, uh, take flexible duct work and uh, go back outside. And you can see it actually, if you look carefully, you'll see those round holes over each, um, each one of the toilets. And lastly, you could only imagine what the, um, um, uh, what the opening was like. <laughs> Uh, because it's New York opening, all these people, they're wearing, they're wearing suits, and they're staring at the backs of the toilets, or they're in the toilets using them. We provided newspapers so they could, you know, they had something to read. So it was, a very, again, a very kind of funny definition of what art might or might not be. Um, and, they, and, and let me just say, as, as I mentioned earlier, and again, this is not, not to pick any bones, but when we first presented, they were quite upset at us. They, they thought we were uh, uh, essentially making the point that people would shit in their gallery. That, that we're inviting people to shit in their gallery. Um, and, we, and, and we talked about this, we talked about you know, Duchamp's urinal, we talked about lots and lots of other references. And anyway, it was a stalemate, uh, and the opening was coming fast. Uh, and long story short, all of a sudden, they, they turned around and they loved the project. They totally wanted this project, because then they started realizing, again, this is not, this is not a value judgment, that it had a certain amount of uh, you know, cultural, political uh, clout to it, that in fact, during this we, during the time we were doing this project, um, they were actually exploring public toilets in New York, and they were actually experimenting with um, uh, Parisian, a, a design from France, uh, Parisian toilets, and they, it never went anywhere. So while they were arguing about it in the newspapers, we actually provided these things. And again, that, that kind of activism for me was, was quite satisfying. Um, these toilets, by the way, that they were experimenting with were really interesting. Uh, things like, for example, using lighting where people could not see their veins so that the toilet would not be used uh, for pursuing drugs or the toilets constantly being washed on the sides periodically so that people wouldn't sleep in there. So even when they're providing this one accommodation for the homeless, they make it very sure that they don't overly use it, let's say. So again, you know, these are considerations that um, by doing a project like this, we began to, uh, to, to uh, discover. Uh, the toilets were serviced once a week. This, this guy came along and took everything out. And then lastly, um, as some of you may know, uh, years after us doing our project, um, the storefront um, got um, uh, Stephen Hull and uh, Vito Aconci to do this facade. So this was a design facade. It's still there, um, still functioning. And I take some, um, some pleasure in, in, in this because I, what they're doing here architecturally, I think, is what we're trying to do as well, which is the exchange inside and outside. And that's how they use this. They can, they can have pamphlets. They can have, you know, they, there's a kind of, it's a more permeable idea uh, of the storefront. By the way, these guys got paid a lot of money. We got paid nothing. <laughs> um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that started happening uh, at some point in the work, and I, you know, I could probably explain why, but I don't think it's super important um, um, uh, you know, to this audience, um, is that I've st I've bec we've become and I've become more interested in process, just pure process, and also material, the nature of materials, what can materials do or not do, how can you detour a material, make it do something that was not intended to do. And this is a project that I think is very much in that vein. It's called Big Orbits. It was done in Buffalo with a colleague and, and a handful of, um, of our uh, students. Um, and it, it involved a gallery space and a courtyard. So what you're seeing here is the gallery space on the, on the left, obviously, the, the, and the uh, courtyard on the right. It turns out that both of them were almost the exact same plan. They were both square. And there was something about the, the kind of negative, uh, a positive nature of that that, that, that we wanted to tap. So what we ended up doing was a project that was actually a kind of solid void project, where there was a piece on the inside and a piece on the outside that in fact nested into each other. And you'll, you'll, you'll understand this as I go, but on the inside, we actually cut what's called a, uh, an ellipsoid. An ellipsoid is essentially a three-dimensional um, uh, ellipse. It's like a football. So if you cut it in one direction, you always get circles, but in the other direction, you always get uh, ellipses. Um, and um, so the idea was that on the inside, we would make a large mass of uh, pallets, wooden pallets. These are all recycled. They can get, we actually got these donated, um, you know, several falls of pallets. And, but they're really incredible material. Uh, unusual to work with because of the space between them, trying to screw things together. There's lots of interesting challenges. But, but just as material, it's incredible. It's all, most of the time, it's very, very resistant to weathering. So, so the point is that, um, that on the inside, we made this large cube, much like this, this spa the space that's, that was sitting in, and then cut an ellipsoid on the inside so you can actually walk through that. And then once you walk through that, you come to the door that goes into the courtyard, and in the courtyard, you see the very shape of the space that you just experienced, the, the football shape. So it goes from a negative to a, a solid. In fact, one person thought that we actually pulled one out of the other, which I can't imagine how you would do that. But 
the point is, uh, like I said, that, that that's what it originated the project. So on the outside, uh, making an ellipsoid um, turned out to be quite, you know, quite interesting. And, and again, who would ever think to, to try something like this? And what we discovered here was that the only way to do it really was to, this is actually very much like, this is interesting to me also because uh, 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 laser cutting, 3D modeling, CNCing have had a huge effect on, on our culture in terms of building culture. And what we did here essentially is what a machine would do today. We're laying down one layer after another that there are a certain shape. But we're doing all of this without a computer. This is, I don't even know if I had a laptop at this point. No? Um, and again, it was very, very time consuming. One of the biggest challenges, I'll, I'll, uh, I think you'll see it in this image. One of the biggest challenges, you can actually see it on the left hand side there, the courtyard. We knew we had to change the centers of the ellipse every single time. And they would change, but they would also be traveling vertically. So how the heck you would do that? We just it took us a while to figure it out. So it became like drawing in space, like a three-dimensional drawing. So if you look at, at that image on the left, you'll see a cable, a taut cable that's directly over top of the form that we're making. And we're able mathematically to figure out where the two centers are, change them every single time we did a new layer, drop plumb bobs, and located our uh, our uh, centers on the actual surface. And that's what allowed us to make that perfect shape. So that, that drawing process, like I said, is, is, is interesting to me because it was literally born of, of necessity. Um, and you know, it was incredible. Uh, the other things, obviously, one thing you know, that I didn't th think too much about initially was that pallets come in different thicknesses. And you can't do this if you had diff varying thicknesses. It just wouldn't work. So we literally had to sort them. But it also gave these amazing individual patterns. And there's, you know, there's I think it's about 30 or 40 layers to this. Uh, and that's the final form. So what you're seeing, I wish there was a figure next to it, but what you're seeing is about 14 feet tall and it's about 30 feet long. On the inside, as I said, it was a totally different process. So on the outside, like I said, once you had the two centers, all you need is a cable that was loose and that would give you your ellipse. You just push a pencil along it. On the inside, you really couldn't do that. It was a different, because you're working on the inside. Actually, it's again, it's like a reverse, like it's like turning a glove inside out. So here on the inside, what we did was we put down a layer, cut it, and keep going. And we discovered that there's a really easy way to do this that actually Charlie and I uh, developed in further projects, at least one of which you'll see soon. Um, but in this, in this particular case, the, um, um, we found that by building these tripods, you can see one of them in front of the ladder, and having essentially a cable that is loose, that if you push in that cable in any possible direction, you're actually shaping a football by definition. So by attaching tools to that loose cable, we were able to draw this, it, regardless of where it was in space, including overhead, once we got to that point in making the shape. So this is a photograph of the entire stack almost complete. You can see the two, op there's an opening here and one at the other end. Um, this is actually with the roof now complete. It's also corbeling, so there's a natural structure. So we don't have to, like, there's really very little cantilevering going on with these pallets. And, and this is, like I said, the final shot of the, of, uh, of the interior. Um, I'm going to pick things up a little bit here because I don't want to uh, take too much, uh, you know, t uh, too much of the time we have here. But um, um, again, uh, another material, another set of experiments. This is uh, latex, uh, paint on latex. Uh, we found that you can paint it on floors, you can do large areas, and it builds up after a certain number of layers. It builds up a very tough membrane. And again, in this case, we had two rooms, so we decided to do, a, again, a kind of dialectic project. And what you're seeing here is a setup. So what we, would, what we did here is we'd coat the entire uh, floor of these two rooms, and after a certain number of coats, you know, let's say seven or eight coats, in one case to the left, we put in a sheet of poly, uh, polyethylene plastic and inserted a series of bicycle uh, inner tube uh, valves. We cut, the, cut them out and uh, basically painted them and used them latex. And on the right, we did a similar process, but instead we put a, lo a long 20-foot uh, steel bar, um, uh, rectangular bar, I think it was two inches by three inches, um, uh, underneath. And then again, put a piece of plastic on top of it and kept painting. So what happens is the plastic stops at a certain point in both of them, and then it just becomes floor. So what's happening is you're actually making a pocket of, of, um, uh, of um, latex. So the project was called Push-Pull. Actually, we had a different, t different title, but once again, politically, it didn't fly. We wanted to call it uh, uh, Suck and Blow. Because uh, it is actually suck and blow, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. But, you know, we just went with push-pull. So here's what I mean by suck and pull. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> suck and blow. So on the left-hand side, we're now starting to inflate the, the form. So we're literally just inventing this form straight out of, the out of the floor. And on the right, we're beginning to ratchet that steel bar to the ceiling. 
And, and, and so that's what we meant by suck. What's happening now is you're trying to actually pull up this latex sheet and there's no air. So the, 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 the amount of force it took us to actually achieve that was, 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 was something. I still don't know where the air got in, but air had to get in somehow. This is a finished shot of the two pieces. You can see one uh, through uh, that opening and the other. Very strange when you first approach this. They look like sand dunes or something. There's something very weird about it. The, um, one of the nice things about the latex is it picks up all the information from the floor. All the cracks start to look like veins. Any coloring that was left in the floor, the latex was picking up as well. And these are two of the final shots. Um, by the way, uh, Terrence is the gentleman to the uh, bottom left. Uh, James is right next to him, and then top right is Anthony Don, who was also an ex-student of mine that also did a number of projects. Um, um, uh, Charlie knows him as well as a kind of a longtime friend. Near the end of the project, we did slice the the um, uh, the um, pole project, and we were able to get inside of it. And that's what I meant about seeing the the, the, the quality of the latex from the inside. And just one image from <coughs> excuse me, a project from um, uh, from Micah. This is uh, where I'm teaching right now in uh, Baltimore. This was a very um, short project. Um, they they um, wanted to um, have a temporary inflatable structure in their uh, in their uh, foyer, in the kind of entry area. And it was to last for three three to five days. It was absolutely not supposed to damage anything. And there was a, it's a very beautiful classical building that we were working in. And so we started thinking about what to do. And, and, and I think one of the things that the students and I both picked up on was that there was this incredible uh, set of columns all the way around uh, the space, and that we wanted to work with these columns. Uh, we then discovered um, that you can buy plastic in tubes. This is what people use to, you know, to vacuum pack things. It's a, it's a long tube. You just put something in it. It, it sucks up the air and gets cut and you keep going. And you can buy that in all kinds of uh, diameters, including large enough to use uh, for mattresses, for example. So we got something that I believe was about three feet in diameter, and we began to make these tubes that we then started feeding through. The, um, uh, the columns, and we found that when we started pressurizing them, they would stay. So initially they would be on the floor, because they, they would obviously just drop, and then as they start to, har to harden, they, they want to go straight, the friction alone kept them exactly where they wanted to be. So we tilted the whole thing to make that point, and as I say, it was just a simple weaving. In theory, I suppose you could do this all the way around all four sides, which would have been, a, I think, quite an interesting um, project. Um, a short project also in, um, um, in Buffalo, or just outside of Buffalo, I should say. And again, uh, uh, James, in this case, was very important to it, and Anthony Dong was also uh, central to this project. Um, again, one of these uh, homework projects that I like to talk about. In this case, this is my backyard, I think, in, um, uh, in uh, Buffalo. And one day, I left a bag of uh, quickcrete out, and you know, we all know what happens when you do that. You get a big briquette. Uh, but I got really interested in this. I thought, is there, is there a way to actually use quickcrete in the bag? And we started doing these experiments, as you can see in this image here, seeing how strong they were, seeing how they nested into each other. And we came up with an idea for a project that was uh, always intended to be in, in, a, in a, a sculpture park. So this is a sculpture park here. It's called Griffiths, uh, just, just uh, south of Buffalo. And again, I was lucky enough to get a donation from Quick uh, Creek Corporation. I think it was for 400 bags of, um, of Quick Creek. And what we did was we found a project that was really based on process. And the other thing, too, it was based on time. This was one of the few projects we've done outdoors. And I, I was really curious about a project that would age over time because of the weathering. So this project is actually a project that was intended to be completed in about 15 years. So we were going to do something, it would start as a trigger, and then 15 years later it would be complete. And I'll explain what I mean by that. The project began by collecting all the deadfall uh, in this one area, in this one clearing. So all the dead uh, 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 saplings and trees. We were dragged in and we made a pile. The pile ended up being about seven or eight feet tall. And then after that, what we did was we carefully laid all the bags of quickcrete such that they were following principles of masonry, you know, one on two, two on one. So you always had to think about, you know, how would the loads be transferred through? And you could also tell they're being layered, so it's, it's thicker at the bottom, a little bit thinner at the top. The idea being that as it would rain, these would harden, and as the deadfall would rot away, it would actually create a stable uh, arch. It would make a permanent uh, structural arch. And it, and it worked. That was, that was, that was the gamble, was, that would this work? So this is literally after we completed it. Not much more than maybe a month or two, much of the uh, paper had gone, certainly was no longer yellow. And you can see that there's a, a little bit of a space beginning to creep, uh, to, to start showing where, where the trees were. They probably at that point just settled a little bit. 
and it's, this is interesting, right? Because animals probably pull things out, humans pull things out, people put things in. But anyway, long story short, about 15 years later, um, I actually got a photograph from, the, uh, from uh, John Spielman, who's the current uh, director of this uh, park, and this is what he sent me. And apparently they've driven AT, uh, ATVs over this. So it, it, it will take a load, it's, it's uh, very, very strong. And I, I haven't seen it, believe it or not, since it, it's been completed. But what I'm really interested in, no one's been able to photograph it yet, is the underside. Because I suspect the underside actually took the impression of the trees. And I'd love to see what that would look like. Um, and again, a, a project that you can just sort of forget about. And it, and it sort of, uh, you know, it, uh, it rises overnight. And it, there it is 15, 15 years later. Um, this is a project with Charlie that, the, that, that I mentioned earlier. And by the way, I, I'm placing this project next to some of these other projects because it is about unit construction, whether it's a pallet, whether it's a bag of quick crate. In this case, uh, Charlie and I to do, decided to do something with uh, cardboard boxes, straightforward cardboard boxes. And uh, the project was in a gallery in Winnipeg, Manitoba. You can see the gallery on the left, and the right is actually the building itself. The gallery is in the basement. Um, and in fact, the only views into the gallery are those little low windows uh, that you can see uh, you know, down, down this area here. Um, and so the idea, again, site specific. So what was specific about this site? The one thing that we were absolutely clear about was that, that it was an incredible structure, all wooden structure, bringing the, the weight of the building down to the ground. We were clear that that used to be full. It was ground at one point. In fact, this is the first and only building ever to occupy that site. So we're very curious about the idea of, of a solid uh, ground and the idea of carving into it as a way to make architecture. And it's similar to this half of the Big Orbit project, but that project, like I said, had, had a, a difficulty in it because we could not actually cut directly with the tools. Here, we managed to do that by actually connecting it to cables. And you'll see the process here um, uh, in a moment. So that, that was, <coughs> excuse me, that's the space there. <coughs> we did some calculations, got the boxes. Um, of course, they were all flat. They had to be assembled. And what you can see in this image is that as we assemble these, we put uh, dabs of, uh, of uh, construction adhesive between the boxes. So these boxes are being connected together in every direction um, for the most part. You'll, there's one uh, caveat to that that I'll explain in a second. So this is the, the process of doing it. You know, nice light project, no, no bags. Quick create is nice. Um, and then this is the uh, finished, or not the finished, but the mid-finished point where we had the entire gallery filled. All, all that was left was enough circulation space on, on two sides. And to the right of this is where the entrance is from the street. Um, what you cannot see in this is that we had prepared that space with a series of armatures that would allow us to do the cuts. So Charlie and I in advance imagined a series of uh, circular cuts in this case mostly, not elliptical cuts, that would actually intersect one another. So we imagined three or four volumes that would literally uh, tie, tie together. Um, and again, that was done largely empirically on the floor with tapes and, and, and such, and got pretty close. So we knew we had to get at those tools. So what we did was the areas that we knew would absolutely be emptied out, we actually did not glue the boxes together, which then makes this project possible. Because at this point, we literally take out some of the boxes that you know you don't need, access the tools, and then we're carefully start making our cuts. So this, for example, is after we vacated part of it, uh, boxes that we wouldn't need. And it was always a guessing game because we really didn't know exactly where those corners were going to be in, in, in space. And you can see actually a, a metal piece here with a cable. These were the kinds of things that we had planted inside of the entire mass. So this is actually now one of the volumes. It, this one happens to be something close to a semi-circle, like, a, like a, let's say an igloo. Um, and again, all the, on, the, on the left is what you first started with. In this case, you see there's a column that we situated in there tied to the floor and ceiling. And we uh, had intended to attach uh, a cable to that that could swing in every direction and then attach a Dremel to it. And that's how we then went about making all the cuts. And you can see on the right-hand side, Charlie, actually, that's his feet, uh, is actually making the cuts. But what we didn't know was what com would come out of it. There was no way to really get a sense of what it would look like until we started doing it. And the, the spatial effect of these in interiors of boxes was amazing to, to me. And the other thing that was really fantastic was that there was a natural arching that happened inside the project. Every cut we made, that arch ultimately ended up helping. And, and the fact that you know, the, the construction of the adhesive was probably doing very little at that point. Uh, but it, you know, it certainly helped in the process. Um, this is actually a view from the window, from one of the windows. So you could actually um, see some of the carving there. And then if you were to go into the gallery, 
you would access the other spaces. Uh, and these are two images, um, especially one on the right, with a person in it, so you have a sense of both the scale, but also how two, the spaces would interlink from one to the other. We designed it so that you would enter the mass from one side, go through three spaces, I think it was, and then leave, um, actually four, and then leave uh, uh, from the other side. Um, coincidentally, Charlie and I were asked to do another project shortly after this, and it wasn't planned, but the, uh, the site uh, is a place called uh, Volume Gallery in, uh, Detroit, uh, in um, Chicago, and um, 2012, and um, it turned, turned out to be an old um, storage building for um, uh, checker cabs. So it, it literally was designed to, to, to house uh, cars. So we got really interested in cars, and of course, one of the I think one of the big un, unbroken um, you know sort of challenge these days is what to do with uh, 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 tires, rubber tires. It's a huge problem. You know, all kinds of uh, experiments. You know, trying to recycle that material, and so Charlie and I were very interested in this. Um, and so you can see in, in the image here, we began to think about how to. Um, how to actually work with tires directly. And we got pretty far. I mean, this was very direct, simple. We understood that by tilting it, it made it more stable. We were curious if we could, if we could go both directions, this way and this way. There's space in both. In fact, on the right, there you can see an opening so you could actually get inside of it. And we just wanted to see what, 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 you know, what, what were the challenges. For example, one of the things that we didn't, I certainly didn't think about in advance is that the best way to do this is actually to make a spiral. Because otherwise, um, the, the problem is you can't assume that all the tires are going to fit perfectly because the circles are changing um, size. So what we did was, if you can, see, you can barely see it, is the platform is actually tilted. It's actually the beginning, beginning of a ramp. So what happens is that the wheels naturally go on top of one another, which then alleviated that problem and probably made it a little bit stronger as well. So that was the project. There's tons of information, I'm sorry, of, of images of this. Uh, Charlie showed me some, uh, um, um, some video from, ye from yes yesterday. I'm just showing this one image. Uh, parallel to that, we wanted to do something else, and uh, along the same theme, the circling was really fascinating to us. We came up with this project, which I, I really liked, because it's the kind of project that could be done anywhere. It's totally transferable, it can be repeated, and every time you get a different result. Here, we really, we were really it was really obvious that the walls had much history to them. There's layers and layers and layers of, um, of the wall being furred out and being changed over time. So what we did was we made a jig with a router that spun and cut into the wall. So we could actually cut, uh, uh, a kind of, uh, uh, it's like a bore, a bore sample. And so what you're seeing here are various stages. The very far one, we went down a quarter inch, the next one maybe half inch, the third one an inch and a half, and then finally we get to the actual brick. And what's fascinating about this for me is that when you first see them, they look like paintings. They look like something that's hung on the wall. But in fact, what you're looking at is what is inside the wall. And it occurs to me you could do this any place. And what it would do, it would actually stamp the building. It would index its, its history, you know, its material history. And, but it would also look like a painting, like a piece of art, which is weird. Um, this project is definitely put next to the, to, to the other one, and I just like I like the um, I like the um, um, you know the, the parallels. But this is a student project, as I said, I you know bounce back and forth. This is three or four students from Ohio State, where I taught for a number of years, and they wanted to do something. Also, they wanted to get their hands dirty. They were uh, watching some projects I was doing with my collaborators, and we decided to take this old Toyota Corolla, which actually Margaret and I owned. And it was dying, and we wanted to give it one last uh, life. And we decided to reprogram the car and to make a car that actually spun in a circle instead of going frontwards and backwards, which to me has a kind of, there's a kind of, um, there's a pun in there somewhere because the whole idea of progress, the whole idea of the automobile taking you from A to B, this one just stays in one place, goes nowhere. Um, and then the, the problem of how do you actually achieve that? And we found a system, a way of actually using the regular tires to go somewhere set of modifications that are very quick, and then you could do your thing. And you can see how we achieved it. We actually have wheels going in two different directions. And by removing the back wheels, the middle wheels uh, kick in. And you can't see it in these, in these images, but there's a huge metal spike underneath the engine. So wherever you plant it, it goes right into the ground, and it becomes our, our pin. So this is actually the car spinning on the left. And on the right is one of my students, and I, I always like to joke, uh, very dizzy as he came out of the car. Uh, I was really worried this car would just fly off, but it never did. It actually stayed there, <laughs> and it was really weird being in this spinning, uh, spinning automobile. Um, the, um, these are the last two projects, um, I believe, yes. So let me, let me uh, um, describe these two projects, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll call it a night. Um, again, big gap in time. This is 19, uh, 1982. 
I almost said 1882, 1982 when I was an uh, undergraduate student at Carleton, and this is my thesis project. I had the good fortune of um, being able to go to Italy uh, for one semester and study Hadrian's Villa. Hadrian's Villa was fascinating to me, this idea that this was a, a house for one person, grant you the emperor of the world. And by the way, a very educated emperor and also an architect. It was Hadrian that actually designed the Pantheon, for example, and many other really important uh, buildings, which is amazing that this person was that, um, you know, that educated. Um, but the point is that, that I, I was fascinated with this place. I drew it, I, I, I uh, wrote, wrote a thesis on it. And then for the second part, I, I decided to re-inhabit it myself. And of course, that's a funny thing to do. So what I, what I decided to do was to make a cast first. So what you're seeing in this image is this 500 pound cast of plaster. And so I made a typical model, uh, walls, all the ruins are left. Uh, I, I mapped them all up, built them, and then cast them. And what you get is everything in reverse. So walls are actually cuts in the ground. Reflecting ponds actually uh, uh, rise up because of reflections. So it's this abstracted villa, but it's the same villa basically. And I then went about inhabiting it. I chose a series of locations. I, I was very much into um, architecture as a language in those days, so I was interested in, I kind of dissected the villa to a series of elements, the, the rep repetition of courts, reflecting ponds, tunnels for the servants, um, et cetera. And I then began to do these plaster casts. Each one of these is about a, is about a foot by a foot. And these are my own interventions. Um, so each one of these casts is actually me re-inhabiting it. And you'll see uh, in a moment that, uh, that these were then accompanied by drawings. We could actually get inside and see what they look like. Yeah, so these are two of the drawings. Um, uh, one having to do, essentially kind of wall house. I think I was probably influenced by um, Raymond Abraham at this point. And then on the left was this, um, this piece is interesting to me, the one on the left. It's actually an upside down house, but it's also got water around it. So it's something that would float if you saw from the outside, but in fact is actually inside of a hole in the ground. And I was really ex excited about like just messing with up and down, sky, earth, water, reflections. So, so that, that, that was a big thing for me. The reason I'm telling you this is because um, this is another project that was done here at Cranbrook, and it, it would be the last project uh, that I show you tonight, um, 1992. And this project is interesting to me, and again, it represents a kind of moment in time for me. Um, after I graduated, I started teaching pretty much right away, and then a handful of years later, uh, I was invited to take part in a, um, a CSA conference. So I don't know if it still happens, but Cranbrook hosts uh, an architectural educators conference, I think pretty much every summer. I don't know if it's still going on. I was invited to come back and do a, uh, a, an experimental studio. So basically they invited eight people. Uh, I think Todd Williams was one of them, Tom Main, Dan Hoffman. There was a series of other uh, educators and myself. I was rather intimidated. I was quite young compared to, to some of those people. Some of those people were my teachers. But, but nonetheless, I was given five of the participants to work with, and the idea is that we would then do an experimental studio to explore the idea of building a ceramic studio on this parking lot right next to the uh, Cranbrook Museum. So what you're seeing right now is actually the, cr the parking lot that the uh, uh, ceramic studios now sit on. Um, and they, they knew they would to build some, actually I think they were even vacillating between dorms and um, at the time, uh, dorms and, and also uh, a new studio building. Um, the project I did was, you know, absolutely straight on, empirical, hands-on. Rather than talking about architecture, let's start making it. Also, it was a conference. The whole point was we were supposed to have discussions. And I thought that what better context to have a discussion with fellow teachers than uh, working together, getting our hands dirty, figuring things out. And that's exactly what happened. It was actually quite a wonderful experience. The project is very easy to describe, and I think you'll get the gist of it. Uh, 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 Cranbrook was very nice and um, gave me this old, uh, old van, this, again, uh, about the I don't know what it, what it is with cars, old cars and vehicles. I seem to, <laughs> seem to end up with them. But um, so we got this van, and what I did was I selected a single parking spot in, in the parking lot, and we excavated the, the um, parking spot using a bulldozer, again, thank you, Cranbrook. Cranbrook. And we actually excavated eight feet down. Um, we then uh, very carefully turned the van over and lowered it into the cavity that we just had just dug. So that's exactly one parking spot, eight feet down. And the idea was that we would do this so that we could cast concrete around it and hence make a unit of space, a room. And the idea would be that you could just keep adding, using found objects, large uh, containers, et cetera. You could actually start casting an entire building. That was the direct idea. And certainly in an experimental situation, that's, you know, that's something that one might want to do. Um, 
Yeah, so the, the van was lowered down. You could see one thing that we were careful to do was to make sure that we had some large timbers at the bottom because we wanted to make sure the concrete got underneath it. And um, we literally poured uh, uh, an entire truck full of concrete all the way around it. Um, one thing that you'll see in a moment is that we were able to cut a hole in the bottom of the, uh, of the uh, car or the truck. So all, while all this was happening, someone was inside actually with a video camera. So I actually have a video somewhere of, uh, of the windows literally being filled uh, you know, to the top with, uh, with concrete. So at one moment when you walk down, um, at that point you walk down the stairs, you could see actually the, um, the museum in the background here. Uh, this is what you would see. Or if you drove into the parking lot, this is what you would see, this large bug basically caught. In, in asphalt. This is the top view of it. And you can see the opening I'm talking about there to the very back. That gave us access to everything the whole time we were working because you could literally see on the inside. And the project was very simple. We, as I said, we, uh, I came up about a week before the conference. We did all of this ourselves. So it was myself and two, maybe three uh, ex-students of mine. And then when the actual conference began, I brought my team out and we spent three days taking the thing apart piece by piece, blow torches, cutting, anything we could. Uh, and of course, you know, I knew full well before we did this that, um, you know, that there's so many undercuts and so many places like handles that the concrete would catch that there would ha had to be, it would be, it's like, it was, it was gonna be like cutting into an animal, like actually taking apart a cadaver. And so you can see here the, the various steps. This is getting very close to the completed project. There's still lots and lots of metal on the sides. And this is the, uh, this is the complete cast, uh, at least one view of it from uh, one side. Um, this is a really interesting image. I, we were talking about this last night. What's interesting to me about this is you're actually seeing the outside of the car from the inside. So it's almost as if you're seeing the inside of the car, like infra thin. It's really hard to explain this, but, but it's a very strange topological condition because you're, I mean, I won't do it, but, if, it, but if, if you turn this, if you flip this image, it actually looks like it's coming out at you and you look at the back of the van. So, so all, again, all these things were really, um, you know, wonderful um, uh, discoveries and, and une uh, unexpected, uh, you know, opportunities. Um, and then, of course, years later, I get a phone call, and they explained to me that um, that um, um, they were going to build a new building, uh, and that they needed to know where the van was. So I should have explained that I missed that part. When the project was done, there was so much concrete that it would require dynamite to remove it, and so we decided to leave it. And what we did is actually we drilled holes at the bottom so that it wouldn't, that, that hydrostatic pressure wouldn't force it back up through the parking lot and backfilled it. Uh, sure enough, a year or two later, it was, it was uh, re asphalted. And then at that point, every, everybody forgot which parking spot it was. And we could not remember for the life of us where it was. And time was going by. So I, so I remember, I mean, I literally came up here to show me drawings of, of um, uh, the new Moneo building and saying to me, where do you think it is? <laughs> And I finally know where it is now. I'm almost positive because when I come back up here, I go there, there's always a different color of grass in that one spot. And I know it's because the van is there. Um, and I can tell you where it is. It's actually, it's in the far corner. Right about here. Just by the way, the entire plan is actually over. It's a four feet lower. So not only is the, the van, you know, uh, under, the, under the parking lot, but it's also four feet down, but still, that mass is having some sort of effect that's discoloring that grass, which I find very interesting. Um, <clears throat> thank you.